All right, welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. I hope everyone is enjoying day two of Horizon Summit. Please continue to engage with us on social media using the hashtag, uh, hashtag Horizon Summit. Uh, we appreciate it and we appreciate your attendance here at this panel session. Uh, this is New World Redefining the Fan Experience powered by Samsung. I'm Dan Kaufman, Sport Techies Managing Director, and I have a great group here that, uh, that I'm thrilled to chat with about this subject of fan experience, fan engagement. This is part of the fan engagement and marketing track that uh, Samsung is supporting. Um, so thank you, you guys, for being here. Thank you to the audience for, for joining. I'm going to give our panelists about 30 seconds to a minute just to give a quick intro about who they are and what they do. And I will start with Ronnie. Ronnie Bryant, go ahead. Great evening, everyone. My name is Ronnie Bryant, Chief Information Officer for the Hornet Sports and Entertainment and Spectrum Center. Um, I handle all technical operations and uh, not technical operations, but all IT operations and telecommunications for the team in the arena. Thanks, Ronnie. Kirk. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> good, uh, good afternoon. I'm Kirk Kessler. I'm a sales manager with the display division for Samsung Electronics America. And specifically, I work in what we refer to as LEAs, so live events, entertainment, and spectaculars. And uh, I've got the privilege of working on uh, primarily professional sports venues and D1 sports venues. Last but not least, Mike. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Michael Rowe. I'm the CEO of Anthony James Partners, and HAP is a, an AV consultant and an owner's rep. Um, happy to be here today. Great. Thanks, guys. So when we were talking about this and prepping for this panel ahead of time, um, you know, I think we kind of divided it into two sections, and, and that's in light of uh, the obvious, which is the COVID pandemic that everyone is going through right now and that we're hopeful to come out of um, sooner rather than later, uh, as long as everything's safe. So we divided it into kind of, you know, our short-term challenges, and we, want, we do want to address those as they relate to COVID. Um, but what we're going to talk more about is kind of the long-term vision, uh, what we see and what these guys here see um, when it comes to a long-term vision of fan experience, fan engagement, once we all are able to go back in full force to uh, sports and entertainment venues. But let's start with the short-term challenges. Uh, and, and I'm going to address this question, and I think I'll probably um, pass it to, to Ronnie first, and then I want other folks to chime in. Uh, but the question is, how do you think, uh, or what do you think that the, the in-venue fan experience uh, will look like during the short term? Uh, particularly during a time of uncertainty where we have, you know, no fans, which, you know, the fan experience at a venue is going to be nothing then. But what do we think it might look like uh, when we have limited fans? And, and how are you approaching that uh, within your organization, Ron? So for us, I mean, I think it's going to, I think the challenge is creating an environment where the fans feel safe, they feel welcome, and they feel as if, you know, they can come and go and, and get the same or, or somewhat similar um, to what they had before. And I think um, the challenge is, is, you know, getting people in and, and making them feel comfortable, you know, with, you know, with, with the setup you have and making them feel as if your building is safe and you took all the necessary safety precautions, you know, um, you know, that, that, you know, is required by the CDC as well as you know the um, the government um, for when they're coming to your building. So I think th those are some of the things we're looking at. You know, uh, temperature scanning and and you know um, cash vis and mobile app and, and having having an environment where they they can feel as if you know they can move and freely move as they want and they have enough you know space around them to six or eight feet, whatever the requirement is at that time. And, and feel comfortable, you know, and as well as, you know, get the entertainment value out of, out of um, attending a, an event, a game or a concert. Yeah. And Mike, you know, one thing that we, we talked about specifically was, you know, maybe a, a concept of how you might be able to, um, to simulate a, a full stadium when there isn't a full stadium, whether it's through, through audio boosts uh, or, or simulating, you know, the actual appearance of, of fans. Tell me a little about what, what you're thinking when you're talking to, to customers. Yeah, I think, uh, We've gotten a lot of interest, uh, and it, it's a short-term kind of a, a, a gap situation, but I mean, 
it, it's a reversal instead of trying to look at the entertainment value for the fans in the building. You know, we've been asked in a lot of these circumstances to try and figure out how to make the building appear right on camera or to appear right, um, you know, to still have the energy within the building. So we've been looking at, uh, you know, maybe a little bit less about the, the spacing of people in, in the building and more about uh, potentially placement of smaller displays um, and mixing in active video with uh, backlits and reinforcing with two-way camera and audio boost to try and get a little bit more energy, uh, not just for, you know, some of the leagues are interested in, and the teams are interested in even creating that energy for the players because they're feeding off what the fans are doing. And right now, you know, even if they go in with a limited number of fans, which is, you know, up in the air, um, they're, they're struggling. So we've looked at a couple of different uh, designs this way. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's really going to fall to what happens over the next, you know, 30, 60 days. I think we'll start to see the league starting to enter and, and say that we want to try something and, and see if it's going to work. But even if it does, I think it's a stopgap. Kirk, anything to add for, to that from, from Samsung's perspective when it comes to video displays? No, I think we're, we're seeing a lot of venues trying to determine how they're going to utilize uh, their video displays and, and breaking up information uh, with the assumption that maybe fans are spread out more in a venue than they would traditionally. So um, there's definitely been discussions about how we're breaking up video displays into segments and windows, so to speak, and also the type of information that's being shared that maybe wasn't traditionally, you know, a few months ago but uh, not, not a whole lot different right there on the usage of displays until we get in. And I know Dan, you're going to jump into, you know, what are different technologies that might be implemented. And I think a lot of it's going to be more informational uh, early on when people enter venues than traditional marketing. Right. So I think we're all used to that, but I think uh, uh, most of the visual displays are going to be more informational early on mm -hmm. as we learn about what this is going to be like. Yep. Well said. I, I was having a conversation with um, a couple of folks in Europe uh, from, from the Bundesliga and from Sky Sports, you know, the broadcaster for the Bundesliga. And, and they mentioned that one thing they were very conscious of was, although we can deliver the fan experience without fans in the stands, we don't ever want to make the fans feel like they're not a critical part of the, the stadium experience. You know, Ronnie, and anyone, but I'll start with Ronnie, you know, thoughts on that comment. Tell us how important that is for you. I mean, that is huge. I mean, you know, um, you know, in sports, especially, and even in a concert or family show, without fans, you, you really don't, you can't really host an event. It's not really hosting an event. <laughs> so, I mean, the, 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 um, I think the players feed off the energy of the fans, you know. I mean, of course, you know, the, um, you know, just the entertainment value, but the fans are very important. And, and even during this pandemic, you know, which, you know, we no one anticipated or expected. You know, what we've done is to con continue to continue to engage our fans as we've kind of used some of the collaboration so, um, tools like Zoom and Teams to keep um, keep interacting with our fans, giving them opportunity to chat with our players, coaching staff, you know, and executives, you know, about how they're addressing this, how they're dealing with it, and, get, and honestly giving them opportunity to chat with them and ask them questions that, you know, typically they're, they're not able to um, ask, you know, so it, it's, it's given us an opportunity to use some of these te use technology and, and tools to allow fans to get honestly closer with our players. Mm. Ronnie, I'm curious what you think, um, you know, it's, there's one concept where the fans watching the game without fans in the stands is a little bit odd, right? But then there's also the concept of the athletes actually trying to perform without fans around, which is also odd. Um, you know, and I assume that you, you probably have some interaction with the athletes given your role, you know, what are you hearing from them, if anything, and, and where do you see, which one of those is more, more odd is kind of the question for me. I almost think that like, as an athlete, you can kind of focus past that, but I'm not a professional athlete. So. Yeah. I mean, I hadn't had many conversations with it because that, that is, I don't think we're in the business of having events just for, for nobody to only watch them on TV. That's what's, what's fun in that. Yeah. Um, but I think, um, you know, I think it'll be a de definitely an, an odd situation to be in a 20,000 seat arena and only, you know, 
50 people are there or maybe yep. 100. And yep. um, I think we'll, we'll use partners like Micro and his team to, to try to create some type of AI, AI situation where when you're watching at home, it looks, it looks like a, a, a 2K game where the, where the building is sold out as well as um, doing things where, you know, you, could, um, you can pump crowd noise or something like that. Try to make it somewhat as close a, as, you know, reality as, you know, or as a, a full stadium as you can. But, I mean, I, mean, I think that's with, with however it seems if we're not able to go back you know, back to the way it was, which, you know, as, as the as the rate is going, we probably won't, we probably look, look at technology where we can kind of, you know, simulate that same environment. Yep. Yep. Well, well, let's think about that. We That's the short term. Let, let's think about the long term, though, because I think we all do expect and hope that uh, at some point we will all be back in a full stadium and enjoying uh, an in-venue fan experience. So let's jump to that. Um, and, and I want to start by asking you guys each to give me your definition of what fan experience, fan engagement is to you. Because I think it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but your perspectives are important. So, so Mike, why don't we start with you? Fan experience, fan engagement, what does it mean? Well, you know, it, it kind of depends on which business you're coming from, I guess, uh, how you view it. I mean, in my case, uh, I'm, you know, I'm technology bound, so I'm I'm trying to figure out um, how the how the the fan is going to be engaged by the technology. Essentially, from the time that they get out of their car, you know, to the time that they get ready to leave the venue. Um, I, I think a couple of things are going to go on, uh, you know, post COVID. But I I think you know one thing that happened, you know, in the 2007 2008 period after we had a recession and we had a disruption was new buildings slowed down, renovations increased, and people started to get a lot more budget conscious. Um, so I think it's a really good time for people to start kind of analyzing, you know, when you talk about the fan experience, what are they trying to achieve? And I think that that word gets very confusing for a lot of groups. Um, and certainly from a technology perspective, I think it's a good time to start thinking intelligently about how you're, you're laying out your technology, why you're choosing specific technology. And I, I think it gets to be a, you know, it's a, it's a cleanup period, I guess, you know, everybody kind of shakes their head and really starts focusing in on what is truly a fan enhancement. Um, you know, for me, for the fan to, to get everything he wants is when he's sitting in Ronnie's building, and he looks around, it's an immersive experience. You know, he's enjoying a live event, but he's also being entertained, not overwhelmed by everything visually. Um, he's not being blasted out from an audio perspective. Um, he's got to get off his couch, so he needs to have a reason to go to that event. And it's the energy, right? He wants to be, he doesn't want ads pounding him at every door, but he wants to be told a story. He wants to be able to find his way easily. He wants to be able to get to the concessions. He wants to be able to see the event, um, but he wants it to be a good experience throughout. And I think that's, you know, that takes some, some planning. And I think what's gone on uh, in the past is now everybody's throwing so much technology at things that it becomes confusing to the fans. So I think it's going to be a time where people start to, you know, there are so many things you can do right now. Maybe it's time to kind of slow down and choose the best things and the most effective. And, you know, the catchphrases, uh, you know, the biggest and the most advanced, uh, maybe you start looking at, you know, what's the most valuable and what's the most impactful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a healthy way of looking at it. I like the way you said that. And I want to get back to that in a minute. Um, and, and maybe this actually is a good segue uh, to kind of move away from that question. Um, although I might get back to it for, for Kirk and Ronnie as we go along, but, but Mike, tell us when you're working with, with Ronnie, are you working with Kirk, you know, tell us a little bit about one thing that you said, uh, which I really like, and that's the, you know, what is too much technology, right? Like if the fan experience is disrupted by technology to a point where it's not enjoyable, then you're failing, right? So how do you go about working with a client and determining and answering that question about, you know, one, what is the ROI that I'm gonna get from this if I'm investing in technology? And two, 
um, not just dollars and cents ROI, but, you know, fan happiness, which does happen to maybe uh, in turn uh, affect your ROI. Um, but how do you evaluate those decisions when you're talking about technology that you might have to have in place for years? Uh, well, you know, um, I, I tend to compartmentalize everything as we go through it. So for us, it's, uh, you know, working with Ronnie was, was really easy, quite frankly, because, you know, it was a complete renovation in that building. It was uh, audio, it was video displays, it was broadcast facilities, it was infrastructure cabling, IPTV. I mean, everything in that building was essentially upgraded. So it was uh, basically laying everything out and saying, here's your options. Um, and the options range from, you know, the biggest, most colossal uh, technology in each of those to, you know, entry level. And you kind of go through and you, you work your budgets. I mean, it's important to understand what you're buying. And, you know, before you go out to bid, before you go out looking for the technology, I believe that uh, what's in Ronnie's building right now and what they wanted was fully decided on before the bid ever went out. The only decision that was made in going out for bid was the choice to go with Samsung, um, which was an excellent choice. And, you know, they did a great job in putting in the equipment, but all of the decisions were made in advance because they understood the costs. They understood the infrastructure. They understood everything involved in it, the personnel, the warranties, the service, the maintenance, you know, what was the purpose of those elements? I mean, Ronnie's got a, a backdrop of the center hung behind him, but the truth of the matter is when you're sitting in that building, it's not, you know, it's, it's got a great personality, but it's not overwhelming. It's not a big mass of brick in the middle of the building. So you can see around you and you've got, you've got corner boards and you've got ribbons that attract your attention, but there's not so many things blinking and jumping at you all the time that you're just visually overwhelmed. Hmm. And I think, you know, and, same with concourses and that, you know, you, you can put in 20 great displays and 20 great pieces of signage in a concourse that tell a story, get your ad revenue, and they'll be a, a thousand times more uh, effective than hundreds of TVs spread everywhere, overwhelming you. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's a matter of sitting down, going through every piece and planning it out. But like I said, I mean, for, for guys like working with Ronnie, it was super easy. Um, they have a, an excellent team. They knew what they wanted. And it was just a matter of choosing from options. And I think we were able to help provide options. Mm. Kirk, uh, what would you add to that? You know, specifically, specifically from your perspective, when you're brought in by someone like Mike and, and Ronnie, and, and, you know, your goal is obviously display. Um, tell me about your thought process and deciding how much display you want, where you want it, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think, you know, we're fortunate enough, the three of us that, that you're speaking with today, that, you know, we get to see things that are several years out into the future uh, from what the public will ultimately see, and we get to make a lot of decisions about that. But I'll tell you, internally at Samsung, we kind of joke about um, when we're talking about displays is that we're, we're kind of our one of our own worst enemies because we make such great product for the home. So how we, uh, you know, what's the incentive for people to come into uh, the venue? And I think... Uh, to add on to Mike's point about displays these days, because I think in all pro sports venues, so to speak, there's always a venue that's got the biggest or whatever that is physically, right? So adding on to Mike, now we're starting to do stuff where we're going to make the engagement more sophisticated, right? And that's what we're going to do, making it more personalized. I think right now we're looking at technologies that you know, allow fans to engage their favorite players, right? People are more involved in statistics than they were a decade ago. So you, you cater to that, uh, that market and also allow, um, we're looking at technologies that allow uh, fans to actually curate their own experience. So whether that's sending messages to their favorite players as in the tunnels, things like that. So that's where we see, I think Mike, um, mentioned that there's gonna be a refinement kind of going on for a period of time. I think that's what we, we really are seeing going forward is there's a lot of different pieces of te technologies that exist right now, whether it's tracking who's going to the concession stands, what the lines are like, but it's really tying that all together with kind of a, 
a custom operating system for each venue. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's really what's going to change the whole engagement and change the experience for people. Because mm -hmm. there's a point where displays, there's enough of them. It's how we're utilizing those and the information that we're, uh, we're using in each venue. Well said. Ronnie, what would you add to that? I mean, I, and I think I'll ask you this specific question. Um, you know, when is too much too much, right? Like, there's a balance, right? Some people just want to come and they want to watch the game. Other people and, and a good chunk of people want to be able to engage with something on their smartphone while they are watching the game. How do you approach that, Ronnie, right now? I'm of, a, I'm of the mindset is, is, is never too much. And that's because you got to cater to so many different um, appetites. And so you may have some that, you know, like you said, I mean, like what we're doing, you know, we have mobile app, we have cashless, we have, you know, like might we might help us get more digital displays in our building that to give the fans uh, several different options. Kurt, Kurt hit on a major point as well. I mean, everybody has a larger appetite for analytics and, and stats now. So we, we realized and found ourselves having to present more, more of that. And everybody wants, you know, everybody loves the center home because, you know, it's, you can't get a, a 80,000 pound um, TV inside of your home. So um, it's good to come to a facility and have that. So, I mean, everybody loves that. So I'm of the mindset that it's never too much. It, it's about opportunities and providing different options so that whatever your appetite is, depending on, on you, we're able to provide that need and, and, and you're happy. I mean, now on, on, on the um, technical side, it's definitely a challenge to manage. Instead of managing one or two different products, you're managing 20 or 30. But um, it's good to have partners, you know, that, that can present you multiple options to choose from and then strategically work with your, your tight budgets to make, um, to make it all work. Fair enough. Um, Kirk, when, when we were prepping for this panel, you had mentioned uh, a specific tech that um, that has a different use now that we're in this COVID phase and that we you know may continue to use in a different way uh, even once we are able to go back to venues in full force and I think that's an interesting thing to talk about uh, and I've enjoyed talking about it with other folks as well but like what are we taking from this experience where we have had to make so many changes and we have had to think so creatively what are we taking from that not only to solve the problem now but one that we're going to keep and it's going to solve a different problem that we didn't even expect it to solve going forward. Uh, the specific one that you mentioned was kind of line uh, movement yeah. throughout the stadium. Go, go ahead, Kirk. Yeah. So um, what's interesting, Samsung, you know, since we've all been involved in this uh, since March or, or slightly before that, right, we're looking for solutions, right? So there's an expectation that, uh, you know, we're going to be monitoring temperatures possibly, right? Don't know it's a moving target we all are, are experiencing that right now but there was a, a piece of technology that was originally developed just to really help a fan understand what the wait times might be at concession or at the restrooms well where that's kind of morphed into now is utilizing sensors and scanners and um, being able to find out are people maintaining proper social distancing because they're following them so that that wait type solution is we don't want them congregating in a particular area, so let's use the digital signage to direct them to another part of the facility. And I think moving forward, we can see that change, as you mentioned, Dan, that now we're going to utilize that to find out where particular fans are going. Do they have a favorite area of the venue that they're visiting that might be different from where their seats are? So that technology is, is in place, but I think it comes back to that original concept of we're going to start refining a lot of technologies that are existing standalone right now and kind of put them into a group to help a venue understand their fans better. The fans get more out of the uh, event. And also, you know, right now in the immediate future is uh, provide a level of protection for the fans and, and the public. Mm, well said. Mike, anything to add to that? What, what kind of uh, technologies do you see put to different uses or do you see being incredibly important once we do go back to having full stadiums? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, I mean, I think Kirk hit it with the word flexibility. Um, I mean, that's, that's really uh, not just about, the, not just about the, the applications that can be reused, but 
you know, right now these facilities, they're looking for how to operate in uh, non-traditional events um, and traditional events. And, you know, philosophically, I mean, we think it's, it's not a bad idea to be second through the door sometimes. The first guy to test the new technology and the first guy to test all the new things, you know, doesn't always work out so well. Mm -hmm. um, he probably pays twice as much and gets half as good as it'll be the second and third iteration. But, you know, you take a center hung, for instance. Uh, I mean, we're looking at different ideas now where you, you know, a center hung is essentially four sides and it's independently controlled because they're looking at maybe using it not just for the sporting events that it's traditionally understood for, but they're so big now and they're so heavy uh, and overwhelming you know, now they're looking at maybe um, double siding them and bringing them down in individual components so that you could use it for multiple events. You know, the idea is to use the technology in flexible ways. I think it's smart to use existing technology that they understand and you have confidence in, um, and they're reusing it in, in smart ways. So I think what Kurt's talking about is, you know, one of the challenges with the, with the COVID situation is much of the investment that you make right now you know, goes up into the ether the minute that they have a solution for this and people feel comfortable without all of the social distancing. So mm -hmm. any investment you make in this, you really need to be able to look at it, not just for today, but what it could amount to in the future. So I think all of the technology, all of the things that we would consider are looked at in the same way. Mm -hmm. That's well said. We've got a few more minutes here. Uh, time has flown by, but uh, I want to want to give you guys a chance to to answer this last question, and I think it'll be a good way to, to close the session. Um, and, and the concept is, you know, in thinking about fan experience and fan engagement, um, you know, once restrictions are lifted and, you know, the government the community and medical community has all told us it's safe to go back to a full stadium, stadium environment, um, how do we, you know, as sports professionals, all three of you, how do you take you know, further steps to convince fans that they should come back, right? It's not so much you can come back, but that you should come back and, you know, not just considering like, Oh, we put in all the best safety measures, but you know, fan engagement measures, fan experience measures, how is it going to be better than it ever was before? Who wants to tackle that one first? Hmm. Oh, I'll, I'll go first. There we go, Ronnie. I was <laughs> so, um, you. so yeah, I think, I think one way we tackle it is we, we present to the fans, you know, the, the precautions we're putting in place to make sure they're safe, make sure they're comfortable. Um, offering them them products and solutions that that makes it make it easy for them to come in and do what they want to do offering them you know cashless registers if they so that you have the option if you don't want to interact with anyone you can you know or or if you don't want to you know use cash you can not use cash you can, you can order from your seat you can use our mobile app where you can you know do express pickup you know offering them and also doing things where you can you know put replays within the mobile app and, and giving them options to where they really don't have to, they won't have at home, but also, you know, whether they're on the side of their, their have heavy precautions on being in the building or if they're on the side where they're, they're comfortable about being around people. They have the tools to, to do either or. Um, as uh, Also on that same note, I mean, I think also we focus on, you know, bringing the entertainment value of, you know, you know, bringing the concerts and family shows that they want to see as well as NBA games. So, I think when, if we offer those, I mean, I think people will be more interested in coming back to the facility and, and be more engaged. I know I'm, I'm tired of, um, I, I, I've gotten so in, in, involved in the cornhole tournaments. I think I can maybe take on Mike Rowe now, um, <laughs> but uh, but I'm, I'm ready to see some live sports. <laughs> How do we televise that right there? <laughs> Mike, uh, Ronnie passed it to you, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I gotta be honest with you, I mean, uh, you're chasing the, you're chasing the, uh, you know, you're never going to catch the, what is the ultimate fan experience? It's an ongoing thing. You know, we're just passengers on the train. Um, I believe that uh, I'm with Ronnie. I mean, I, I want to see an event. Like I, I, I'm jonesing to uh, cheer at a, at a basketball game. I need to see some hockey playoffs. I want to see uh, a concert. Like, um, you know, I, I think that fans are going to want to come back in. And I think, you know, I have to believe that this is going to have uh, a positive end at some point. 
I think everybody is kind of going a little crazy or stir crazy being stuck inside. But I believe that the fans are going to want to come back. And uh, I think, you know, I think we're going to do our best to try and give them the best technology and the best enhancements anyway. So. Fair enough. Kirk, the last word. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, Samsung's always going to be developing new display technologies. It's, you know, we're seeing stuff that's two to four years in the future. But I think right now we're talking about what are we going to do that makes the experience different when fans step out of their car, like Mike and Ronnie have talked about. What are we going to use with existing technologies, incorporate those uh, to make it seamless, make it easier than maybe it ever was before. I think fans are going to have an expectation that maybe entering a facility is going to be difficult. I think you need to work on kind of calming any of those fears. And uh, I think I'm in agreement with uh, my buddies here that everyone wants to get back in and, and, and see that. I had an opportunity to fly a week ago and it wasn't flying like normal. So I'm ready to, for everything to be back to normal. I think the fans are going to embrace it very much. So, yeah. Well, I can skip the flying, but I'll take the rest. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, is, it is strange walking through empty airports. So we want full, full venues. That's for sure. Great. Kirk, thank you. Mike, thank you. Ronnie, thank you. Thank you to our audience. Please enjoy the rest of Horizon Summit Day 2. Have a great day. Cheers, guys. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks.